Well, all right, here we are again. I hope you had a great Christmas and now we're back to work. Okay, so um, here's what we'll be doing today. We'll be diving back into chapter five. And if time permits, um, we may start chapter six. So um, I think I may have neglected to post chapter six on Moodle. So let me go check that out. Uh, let's see. Uh, oh, and also don't forget, you should have your uh, chapter three problem set ready tomorrow, not today because of the holiday, but tomorrow. That will be quite sufficient. And I'm sure you noticed that it's just exactly what we were doing. Um, if you're stuck, if you can, if you need help, you know, you can always send me emails. <clears throat> Oops, this is not where I wanted to go. Um, hold on. Okay, so send me a push. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Let's open this up. I think uh, if so, I'll do it right now. <clears throat> So um, let's see, I got, uh, I managed to get everything. Yeah, all right, all right. Let me just put it in right now, chapter six. I think we may just get it started today. Um, five won't, won't take up the rest of the, of the day. So let me sneak that in there. And while we're at it, how about the problem set? All right, so that should take care of it for a little bit longer. Uh, later on, I'll just add more material. Um, you know, obviously last week was pretty hectic with final exams and uh, Christmas and all, but now we can focus on our um, coursework here as if it were the regular semester. How about that? Um, okay, so let's get back to the slides, uh, which I thought I'd opened. Oh, here it is, here it is. Okay, so now remember in this part of the chapter, we mentioned that there are three rules that we would like to be introduced to. And these rules make it possible to calculate probabilities for what are sometimes called compound events, which means functions of events or combinations of events. So we've already covered the addition rule and the complement rule. We saved the multiplication rule for last because it's fairly involved and it does involve some other definitions that we hadn't seen before. So we're gonna do that right now. We're gonna work through an example from start to finish, which will illustrate several of these key concepts before we actually formally define the multiplication rule. So um, let me just jump down here and find it. Uh, let's see, here we go. So the multiplication rule is defined in terms of condition, sorry, in terms of what we will call conditional probabilities, which in turn, are computed from what are called joint probabilities. So that means we now need to introduce some of these new concepts before we can actually introduce the multiplication rule. Otherwise, it won't make any sense. So we start out by creating a table. And this table will be known as a joint probability table. And what we've basically done is we've taken a set of data and we've broken it up into two categories. And within this table, we'll be able to calculate joint probabilities and what are called marginal or sometimes unconditional probabilities. So here's the setting. We have um, a school out there somewhere which has a business school. Now, many universities of course have, or colleges have a business school um, where you take majors like finance and accounting and marketing and maybe operations research and now they're getting into other areas like um, you know, e-business, e-commerce, things like that. So most business schools have um, a, a lot of different majors to choose from, but it's often separate from the rest of the school. Either you're majoring in business or you're not. I mean, typically that's the way it's set up. Now at Purchase, we don't have a business school, but we do have economics. Okay, if you, need, if you want business, you can choose another uh, school or another branch of the SUNY system. But um, if you were at a school that had a business program, <clears throat> at the very least, they would offer majors in finance, accounting, and marketing. So we're assuming that this school has three majors, 
And also they offer two different levels of degrees. So um, first they have what's called a BBA or Bachelor of Business Administration, which means a traditional college degree. It just so happens to be in business, okay? As opposed to a BS or a BA, which is what you're probably getting right now. Um, and then if you're really ambitious, you can go on to what's called graduate school. And in graduate school, you get to take more advanced courses and get more advanced degrees. So a very popular one is called an MBA, and that stands for Master of Business Administration. So you have to finish college first before you can get an MBA. But if you do, it most likely it'll open doors to new jobs that you might not have had access to before. And also it'll almost certainly raise your salary. So this is a very popular uh, degree for people who've majored in business. <clears throat> so um, what we've done here is in this table shown that we have people, um, so all the students in this business school are broken up by their majors and what level they're studying at. So for example, um, you can see that this 130 is circled. That means that there's 130 people in the school who are getting their bachelor's degree in finance. And this other circled number means that there's 35 students who are getting an MBA in accounting. And so all six of these within this box are joint, um, we will see that they're called joint probabilities because what's happening here is that they're telling us two things at once, the level at which you're studying and the major that you've chosen. On the sides, you can see we have totals. These are just column totals and uh, row totals. So for example, the circle 215 means altogether in this business school, there are 215 accounting majors at both levels. Okay, and at the bottom, you can see there are a total of 500 students in the entire program. Now with this information in hand, we can do a lot of calculations. Now, by the way, just for simplicity, we're going to from now on use single letters to represent uh, this information. You can see, for example, B is getting a bachelor's degree, M means getting an MBA, F means you're majoring in finance, A means you're majoring in accounting. And here's where we run into a problem. I can't call this M for marketing because it's already taken by MBA. Um, so therefore I chose T <clears throat> to represent that because T is in fact in the word, it's just that it's not maybe your first choice, but we're gonna use T to represent marketing. Now, with all this information in hand, what can we calculate? Well, we're gonna start out by calculating what are called joint probabilities, as we've already started to mention. So if I wanted to know, let's say that for some reason, the school has an alumni magazine that they publish every year, and they randomly choose a student um, to be on the cover of that magazine. And so this year they decided to pick that student from the business school. So the question is, if we pick somebody at random from this uh, business program, what's the probability that the person we chose is getting their bachelor's degree in finance? So it's a very simple concept because all you have to do is count up the number of people who fall into that category and divide by the size of the entire business school, which is of course 500. So very simply, this probability would be 130 out of 500, which is 26% or 0.26. And you notice we can write it with a symbol. Remember this upside down U is the set operator intersection, which also can be expressed with the English word and. It means the same thing, and intersection, it represents the same idea. In other words, these are all the people who are both getting a bachelor's degree and majoring in finance. So that's 130 out of 500 or 26%. Now based, but by the way, you notice that we're implicitly assuming that everyone is equally likely to be chosen. If not, we have to do something different. Okay, so based on this understanding that everybody is equally likely to be chosen, um, the probability of getting somebody with their bachelor's degree in finance is 0.26 or 26%. How about MBA in accounting? All right, let's go back to the table for a second. What is, that's why this is circled, by the way. Those are the two examples I chose. Um, what's the probability that we've chosen somebody who's getting their MBA in accounting? It's 35 out of 500 because there's only 35 people who are doing both. 
uh, getting their MBA and studying accounting out of 500. And so that probability, which is written as M and A or M intersect A is 35 out of 500 or 7%. So all of them, all the so-called joint probabilities, okay, just a reminder, a joint probability is the probability that two events have, are both true, I guess. Or you could say that they have both occurred. It means the same thing. So in other words, it's true this person we've chosen is getting an MBA and they're studying accounting. Now, altogether, there's in this table, there are six joint probabilities that we can calculate. You could also, for example, calculate the probability that somebody's getting their bachelor's degree in marketing. That would be 90 out of 500, or maybe their MBA in finance, which is 45 out of 500. Altogether, all the combinations are available, um, covered in this box. And, but what we can also do is take this one step further and we can ask questions about not joint probabilities, but the probabilities of, for example, somebody just getting an MBA. Okay. In other words, if we just wanna know if this person that we've chosen is getting their MBA, regardless of their major, then we'd have to include all the MBA students. And that means altogether, we're looking at 100 people out of 500. Now that is not a joint probability any longer because we're only considering one thing and that's whether or not you're getting an MBA. We're completely disregarding the major. So in a case like that, we have a different name for that type of probability. Uh, let me skip ahead a little bit here. For MBA only, we call, we, well, first of all, that probability is clearly 20% because there's 100 MBA students out of the entire business school. But because we're not looking at two different events at the same time, this is a different kind of probability. This one has two equivalent names. It can be known as either an unconditional probability or sometimes it's called a marginal probability. All right. So now that's just terminology. Um, you, you know, you just try to remember uh, either unconditional or marginal, but it simply means we're looking at a single event, in this case, MBA. And there are others as well, of course. If you go back to that table, you'll see, for example, what if I just wanted to know the probability that a randomly chosen student is studying accounting? Okay. I don't care if they're getting a bachelor's or a master's degree. I just want to know uh, what's the likelihood that they're actually majoring in accounting? So if you go back to the table, what you would do then, say, oh, altogether, there are 215 students studying accounting at both levels out of 500. So therefore, that probability would clearly be 215 out of 500. And let's see where. Yes, 215 out of 500, which is 43%. Okay, so 43% of the students are studying accounting, regardless of the level that they're studying at. Okay, and there's, there's others as well. Um, you could, for example, ask the probability that a randomly chosen student is getting their bachelor's degree. Well, once again, if you look at that table, you'll see that there's 400 students getting a bachelor's degree out of 500 total. So that clearly gives us a probability of 400 out of 500 or 80%. So again, this is an unconditional or marginal probability because it refers to a single event. All right, so, so far we now know two different kinds of probabilities, joint, which is the probability of two things both being true and unconditional or marginal, which is the probability of a single thing being true. So what is left? You might think, well, what else could there possibly be? But we've saved the best for last here. This is the probability 
type that we need for our multiplication rule. So the third and final type of probability in this section is called a conditional probability. This is the important one. This is the one that we are building up to, so to speak, to help us truly understand what's going on with our uh, multiplication rule. So basically what you're looking at, and we'll see several examples of this, um, it's the ratio of a joint probability to a marginal probability. And essentially what it's doing here is saying, listen, what is the probability of one event being true knowing that another event is also true? So in other words, with a conditional probability, assuming that we have knowledge of another event and whether or not it has taken place. So don't worry, it sounds very abstract, but you'll see it with a couple of examples, it's a fairly straightforward idea. All right, so let's start with this one. And again, using the business school example, what if when I choose somebody for the alumni magazine, I don't randomly choose them from the entire student body or the entire business school, I should say. Instead, what if I only choose a random, uh, a student at random from the students who are getting their bachelor's degree? In other words, I completely ignore the MBA students. I pick somebody, I go out of my way to pick somebody who I know is getting their bachelor's degree. That's a very different scenario than what we've been considering up to this point. I'm excluding the MBA students. I'm only looking at the bachelor's students. And once I know that information, what then is the probability that that student that I've chosen is majoring in marketing? Well, that's a different outcome, isn't it? Because if we come up here to the original table, if I am picking somebody at random from the entire business school, the probability that they're studying in marketing is 110 out of 500. But now I've been told that I'm not looking at the whole business school. I'm only considering the bachelor's students. So all of a sudden, that means that I'm asking, what's the probability of choosing one of these students out of 400? Okay. In other words, since I'm only looking at bachelor's students, 90 of which are majoring in marketing, it must be true that this probability is 90 out of 400. So again, this is a very different situation because we have knowledge of the fact that we did not choose an MBA student and that changes our results. So we ended up with 90 over 400. Uh, whoops, whoops, whoops. Let me jump down here again. Um, oh, but yeah, okay. So um, yeah, I'll tell you what, let me just do one little thing here. So yes, based on the logic that I've just shown you, that probability is 90 out of 400 instead of 110 out of 500. Now, what I wanna show you though is this, um, with these tables, sometimes, we don't really need to know the actual number of uh, outcomes in each category. We only are interested in the probabilities. So what that means then is that you can actually divide in this case, the entire table by 500. And when that happens, all these numbers all suddenly become probabilities. So we're going to take that approach in, in the next section we're going to actually replace that table with this one. So in other words, you see that what's happened is the original totals were all divided by 500. So that now, <clears throat> for example, when I wanna calculate the probability of BNF like we did before, instead of dividing 130 by 500, it's, this is already a probability. I can just read it right off the table. So for some purposes, this is, this is actually a better way to go. If we needed to know the actual number of students in that category, then this doesn't help us. But if we only care about the probabilities, then we can replace our original table with this one, 
because all the, these numbers are already probabilities. So we want to do that now when we introduce conditional probabilities. It'll just be a little bit simpler, that's why. So anyway, this case we were just considering, um, cons we we're looking at the probability that somebody is majoring in marketing, given that they're studying at the bachelor's level. And now instead of um, 90 over 400, we're going to consider 18, 0.18 over 0.80. That ratio will give us the probability that we need. Okay. So <clears throat> now I just want to point out this probability. Oh, I don't want that. This probability is the probability of B and T. This probability is the probability of B. So that will help us understand what's coming next. What we have here is this, these two probabilities, 18 versus 80, which is highlighted in this chart. And the probability that we need is the ratio of this 0.18 to this 0.80. So whereas it, we now need to introduce a more formal way of expressing this. And so we need some new notation to represent what we've just done. And so this is what it looks like. Okay, now you notice it's written like this. That little slash is pronounced given that. So in other words, this time something is different because we know that the student is getting or pursuing a bachelor's degree. With that information in hand, now we'd like to know the probability that the student is studying marketing. Okay, so the bar says given that, and this is known for the first time, we're now seeing that this is a conditional probability, and which means that the probability of T depends on whether or not B is true. Okay, that's what this is all about. Probability of T Uh, depends on B, okay, or whether it's true or false. And so it, this is a different type of probability than we've seen before. And formally, we calculate it by taking the joint probability of both of these being true, divided by the unconditional probability that B is true. So here's something you'll want to memorize. All right, so whenever you see one of these conditional probabilities in the numerator, you have the probability that both of these are true. And in the denominator, you have whatever's in the bottom here. That is always going to be in the denominator. The numerator will always be the joint probability of both B and T. So you notice we ended up with 8, 0.18 over 80, which is 0.225. So that's how these are done. So it's a little tricky, but you'll get used to it pretty quickly. The key detail here is that you were given a certain piece of information here, for example, we know that this person is getting their bachelor's degree. With that being said, what is the probability that they're studying marketing? That makes it a conditional probability. And that means we have to approach it like you're seeing here. And that's the one that we need for our multiplication rule, by the way. That's what this has been all about. This whole example is designed to help make it easier to understand what a conditional probability actually is. All right, so we're going to do a few more of these because obviously we can use some practice. But once you've done a few, you'll start to say, oh, is that all there is to it? It's not that hard. All right, so let's try another one. 
the probability that a randomly chosen student is studying or getting an MBA, given that he or she is majoring in accounting. The most important thing to do here is to write this out correctly. What do we know? We know that the student is majoring in accounting. With that knowledge in hand, let's figure out the probability that he or she is getting an MBA. And based on the definitions we just had, the way we do this is to calculate the joint probability of both M and A, and we divide that by the probability of A. So now all you have to do is look these up in the table and you're all set. It's so straightforward, it is. But again, you, after you've done this a few times, you'll start to see that it is a very straightforward idea. Okay, so let's go look it up and find out. So the table is here, M and A is here, and um, just, we need M and A, both uh, MBA and accounting, and A by itself is here. So we need the ratio of 0.07 over 0.43. Okay, so, uh, oh, here it is, it's down here. I didn't have to circle those. Um, it's already been highlighted for us. In fact, let me get rid of these. Don't want it to get too cluttered. And guess what? Now all we need is the ratio of 0.07 to 0.43. And there it is, 0.163. All right, it's that straightforward. Now, I think we could use some more practice. So I'm going to make up another one on the spot. Let's just say, suppose that a finance major is randomly chosen. What is the probability that he or she is getting an MBA? So again, the challenge is trying to make sure you set it up correctly. We know that this person is studying finance. Aha, uh -huh, that's how it works. Therefore, we can put anything we want here. In this case, we're gonna go for the MBA. And by definition, we need the joint probability of M and F in the numerator, and then we'll divide that by the probability of F Remember, that's the one that we're given. And then we can go back to the table. M and F is right here, 0.09. And F is 0.35. Okay, <clears throat> so um, that works out to be about 0.257. Okay, so um, that's how this is done. So any conditional probability you may encounter is done in exactly the same way. The challenge is making sure you set it up correctly. If you got the M and the F backwards, for example, you're definitely not going to get the right answer. So the, the challenge is just making sure you know what information we already know and let that be, um, on the right-hand side of this expression, all right, after the slash, okay? So now, with all that being said, we're ready for this multiplication rule. The multiplication rule is designed to tell us how to handle joint probabilities. In other words, the probability of two things being true at once. So it's defined in the following way. There's two equivalent versions of it, okay? 
So you can see now why this is all necessary, all this discussion about conditional probabilities, because now this formula makes perfect sense, or at least you, can, you know what this means. So you can see that that probability is the, can be written in two equivalent ways. By the way, just in case I didn't make this clear before, I'll add a little note here. When it comes to these set operators, the order in which you write the events does not matter. In other words, B and A and A and B are the same thing. The same thing is true for unions. So don't worry about that. But up here, it does matter a great deal of the order. In other words, here, yes, of course, you've got to have the right one before the slash and after. But so in other words, you can write, if, if the problem was A and B, just remember, it's the same as what you're seeing here. All right, I just wanted to, just in case I, did, I forgot to mention that. Just like um, it's equivalent to saying three plus four equals four plus three, or saying that three times four is four times three. It's perfectly analogous to uh, these algebraic operations where the order is irrelevant. Okay, because intersect, oh, you know what I just realized? I wrote them backwards, didn't I? Let me, let me try that again, um, because and is equivalent to times. And this one would be equivalent to plus. There we go. All right, just to get that out of the way. So we've got two equivalent ways of approaching this multiplication rule. You'll use the one that where you have that information. In other words, you can pick the one where you have that, um, you may not have both B given A and A given B in your problem. You'll always pick the one that makes the most sense. Now, here's a simple example. What if a card is chosen from a deck? That's simple. We'll define A as the event that the card is an ace and B as the event that the card is black. Now, just in case you're getting rusty with your knowledge of cards, let me just quickly remind you. It's possible, you know, you may have played cards when you were a kid, but you may have started to forget. Um, a deck contains, I'll just throw this in here, review. Um, now, by the way, this is a standard deck of cards. There's no jokers in here. When you're a little kid, jokers are fun to have wild cards in all the games, but no, this is, this is a real deck. Um, 52 cards divided into four suits, spades, clubs, hearts, diamonds. Oops. Spades and clubs are black. Hearts and diamonds are red. Each suit contains 13 ranks which are ace, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then the last three are the so-called royal cards or face cards. All right. So I just wanted to remind you of this, just in case what follows will make sense. Um, interestingly enough, you know, the standard deck that we have today wasn't always like this. Um, the cards have evolved throughout the centuries. There were times in history when there were more royal cards in the deck. Um, and so, and the suits themselves haven't always been those four. There have been others as well. So it's kind of an interesting, uh, historical area uh, to, to look at the evolution of playing cards over time. Same thing with chess. The rules of chess haven't always been the same either. There were periods in history when there were more pieces on the board and the boards were bigger, but now we have what we consider standard chess. But anyway, um, that being the case, just remember, um, well, all right. So when you ask, what we're gonna do here is ask for the probability of the card being both a bl black and an ace. In other words, we're being asked for B and A. Now, 
this actually, we know in advance because we understand how cards are, uh, work. This is equivalent to saying, what is the probability that this is a black ace? Now, keep in mind, we're assuming that as usual, all the cards are equally likely to be chosen, which should be the case with a standard deck of cards. Okay, so that means um, since there are two black aces in the deck, the ace of spades and the ace of clubs are both black. Um, oops. Whoops, ah, oh, God, hold on. Before we even start doing the multiplication rule, we already know that this probability has to be two out of 52. Again, because there's 52 cards equally likely to be chosen of which two are black aces. So the probability is very simply two out of 52 or one out of 26, but it's not always possible to do this. It's, you don't necessarily always have full information about the sample space. So it's good that we have alternative ways of coming up with these probabilities. Um, usually in statistics, as in all branches of math, there's multiple ways of getting at the same result. And so here, we're going to use the multiplication rule to prove that this is true, or at least demonstrate that the multiplication rule works correctly. So what we're going to do is start with the first one. We're going to try this one and say, listen, let's follow this approach and see what we come up with. So that means we need to determine the probability of B given A and the probability of A. Now, the A is easy. A means you've chosen a deck, an ace from the deck. Since there are four aces in a uh, deck of 52 cards, that's very simply four out of 52 or one out of 13. Okay. The second one is a little trickier. This one is telling me um, the probability of choosing a black card from the aces in the deck. Not the entire deck, just the aces, because this A tells me that we know this is an ace. And now we know that there are four aces. As I said before, spades, clubs, hearts and diamonds. And we already know that only two of these are black, the other two are red. So therefore, the probability of B given A is four, uh, sorry, two out of four. So once you observe that this card is an ace, the chances of it being black are one half. So what do we do with this information? Oh, that's right, we have this wonderful multiplication rule, which says to do the following. Multiply these together, right? In other words, one of the two equivalent versions says to do this, which is one half times one thirteenth. Oh yeah, that's what we had before, isn't it? It sure is. Okay, well, that's comforting to know. Now the second approach, which means this one, means we need to determine the probability of B and the probability of A given B. Well, B is easy. B 
because 26 of the cards are black out of 52, which means a half. But what about A given B? This is basically the probability of choosing an ace from the black cards. So among the 26 black cards, two of them are aces, spades and clubs. And so that's very simply two out of 26 or one out of 13. So therefore, when I come up here, I have 113, one half, 126. All right. So we've confirmed with both uh, examples or approaches to the multiplication rule that it's giving us the correct answer, one out of 26. Nice. All right, so every situation will be different, but this in a nutshell is how the multiplication rule works. Now, you might recall that when we were using the addition rule, which let me go back and re refresh your memories about the addition rule. The addition rule was designed to help us calculate probabilities of unions. Now, you also recall that there was a special, simpler version of this addition rule that we could use if A and B were mutually exclusive, because that meant there was no need to um, subtract this intersection. Um, it's here somewhere. There it is. So as long as A and B are mutually exclusive, then we have a simpler version of this rule that we can use. Now, with the multiplication rule, it turns out that there is also a simpler version that we could use, but it has nothing to do with being mutually exclusive. It requires the events to have a very different relationship with each other, which is independent events. So this is an important concept. If we have two events that do not affect each other, then they're said to be independent. Now, there's a formal definition that we'll look at in a minute, but when you think about it, many events are completely unrelated to each other or independent. There's no necessary, it's not necessarily the case that there are any two events are related to each other. Um, let's say, for example, just a quick, quick example. Suppose that A is the um, stock market will rise tomorrow. And B equals it will rain tomorrow. Now, it, it, there's really no reason to think that the weather will affect whether the market will go up or down. So <clears throat> in a case like this, we would conclude that A and B are independent because um, the weather, well, I mean, it's not that the weather can't affect the stock market. I mean, if we had tornadoes and they destroyed half of our uh, oil refineries, that would affect the stock market. But just in general, the weather, rain, not rain, the weather doesn't affect the stock market. Not really. And the stock market certainly does not affect the weather, well, that's for sure. So just to give you a sense, an intuitive sense of what independence really means, it means that they basically have nothing to do with each other. And I'm sure you can think of a million examples. Um, like you can, A is the event that you get an A in this class and B is the event that you um, got everything you wanted for Christmas. You know, really silly things like that. What do they have to do with each other? Absolutely nothing. Um, so we're gonna see what this means and what effect it has on the multiplication rule. So <clears throat> now this time we're going to pick a card from a deck and then we're gonna look at it and then we put it back in the deck and then we take another card. 
Uh, it doesn't say so here, but let's say we also shuffle the deck just to make sure we don't accidentally pick the same card again. So we've got the events A, the first card is red, and B, the second card is red. Now, here's the key detail here. Because the first card was replaced before the second card was chosen, the outcome of each draw is independent of the other. So in other words, after I pick the first card and then I put it back, whether or not I get an ace is, is not going to depend on what the first card was because I put it back. If not, that would be a very different situation. But because we put the card back, these draws are independent of each other. And we call this process sampling with replacement. This is just for you. You don't have to memorize this. Sampling with replacement, meaning that when you take an element from the um, deck of cards and you put it back, the draws are independent of each other. So what effect does that have in our multiplication rule? Well, what if I wanna know the probability that both of these cards are red? Well, we know that there's 26 red cards in the deck. Therefore, the probability that the first card was red is 26 out of 52 or one half. What about the second draw? Same thing. Oh. But we could also sit now watch this. The probability that the second card is red, B given A is a half. But if you notice, because the cards were replaced, these are both one half, which means that knowing that A, the first card was red, has no influence on whether or not the second card is red. Aha, uh -huh. so it's like, imagine me telling you, like, what's the probability that the stock market goes up tomorrow? Given that it is, the forecast is for rain, that would have the same probability as saying, what's the probability that the market goes up? Because the rain has nothing to do with anything. Interesting. So then when we plug these numbers into our multiplication rule, look what ends up happening. The probability of them both being red is a half, uh, a half times a half or a quarter. But guess what? That's the same thing as simply multiplying these two together because these are equal to each other. Now, if we flipped it around, we'd find the same thing. Um, but what matters here is that independent events have the following key properties. This, um, both, both of these, by the way, have to be true for A and B to be independent. B given A is the probability of B, which means this, knowing that A is true, does not affect the probability of B. And conversely, knowing that B is true does not affect the probability of A. This is what we mean by independence. Knowing that it's going to rain doesn't affect the probability of the market going up, knowing that the market goes up doesn't affect the probability of it raining. This is what independence means. That you can think of them as being unrelated to each other or they don't influence each other. Now, with that in being said, look how simple the multiplication rule becomes when this is true. Oh, it's so easy. Uh, oh, what happened here? Something's 
Oh, no, that's right. Sorry. I thought I made a mistake, but now I realize I did not. The probability of A, look how easy this is. Instead of this or this, we can just write it as the product of these two. Wow, that is so nice. It's a lot simpler because we do not have to worry about conditional probabilities. So let, let's try um, another quick example. Suppose that a coin is flipped twice. A is the first coin, first slip is heads. Now, the two flips are clearly independent of each other. In other words, when you flip a coin and it turns out heads, the coin doesn't remember that it was heads. And it, the, you know, the next flip is just as likely to be a head as the first one. So the probability of getting two consecutive heads And so basically what you're doing is just saying, all right, well, it's a quarter. There's a 25% chance of getting them both heads because the flips are not related to each other. Therefore, um, we, we have this result that you can just multiply the number of flips uh, by half, and then there you go. And based on that logic, let me just throw this in here too. The probability of three consecutive heads Based on the same reasoning, it would simply be a half times a half times a half, which is one eighth. And again, it's because the flips are not related to each other. So yeah, so you can see the multiplication rule with uh, independent events is quite simple compared to the full version where the events may not be independent of each other. So, but now we've covered all of the different compound probabilities. And so that's, I mean, we're, we're kind of zooming along now. So um, now I do want to mention here, there's one final topic in this chapter, which it's very complex. And it's one of those topics that we don't always have time to cover. And I think that, since we have such a short uh, class now, I would like to not go over this Bayes theorem because well, when you see the formulas, you'll say, oh my God. Um, I think we can skip over this because we really don't have time to, to, uh, to go over it in such a short set time setting. It's kind of, um, like I said, it's one of those topics that it's sort of optional. You don't always get to it anyway. So I think we'll pass over this and if I accidentally leave it in one of the problem sets, then you're not responsible for it, okay? It's called Bayes theorem. It's interesting. It's a, basically an extension of conditional probabilities, but I find that it's, it's more trouble than it's worth in, in, in a short class like this. So we will skip over this and go directly into chapter six now. Okay, now you can still read it if you want to, but um, you won't be held responsible for it in this class. All right, so now it's time for chapter six. Now, chapter six is a very interesting chapter. We're going to introduce some of the most important concepts that we're going to see in this class. And in fact, these concepts will show up over and over and over again. 
throughout the course. So it's, you know, some topics are obviously more important than others. This is one of the really, really important ones. We're introducing two new ideas. We have the concept of the random variable and the probability distribution, which are directly based on the random experiments that we've been performing. All right. So what exactly are these all about? Well, first, of course, we're going to look at random variables. A random variable is a simple idea. It simply assigns numerical values to the outcomes of a random experiment. Now, it's, this is being done for convenience because remember when we had that example with the dice, we were only looking at evens and odds. It's awkward to keep track of E's and O's when you have more than a couple of roles. Um, it becomes an issue. So um, what we're gonna do is essentially replace the letters with numbers, but in a very specific way. Okay, so you'll see what I mean in a second. We're, our goal is to make it easier to calculate probabilities by taking all the possible outcomes of an experiment and assigning them a number, okay? Obviously numbers are easier to work with than letters or colors or flavors or whatever the case may be. So if you remember, again, that example of the dice, remember uh, we rolled the die twice, we were only focused on um, evens or odds and the sample space was this. And we were able to calculate probabilities from that sample space, but it's such a small sample space that, you know, it worked well, but if we roll a die, let's say 10 times, you're starting to get a very big sample space and trying to calculate probabilities by counting the elements that have certain characteristics starts to become very, very awkward, very quickly. So instead we'll use numbers. And by using numbers, we can actually start to create formulas, actual equations, for calculating our probabilities rather than simply counting, which could take forever if we have a large sample space. So let's just say that we're playing a game in a casino with these dice and the prizes that you win depend on how many evens turned up when you roll the dice. So we're gonna define our first random variable, X will represent the number of times that an even number turned up during our experiment of rolling the dice. So we're focusing our attention on evens. How many evens did we get? Well, what we are going to do now is use X to assign numbers to these four outcomes. So here they are. Now, by the way, in a sample space, the individual elements are often referred to as sample points. Okay, so when you see that phrase sample point, it just means an element of your sample space. Now, if you notice over here, X represents the number of evens. And clearly when you get two evens, well, you get a two. In these two cases, we only get one hit, uh, one even rather. And then down here we have none. And it's just that simple. When you see two evens, you, X becomes two. When you have one E, regardless of when it occurred, by the way, you get a one. And then with no, this last one with two odds, you clearly have no evens, which means you're looking at a zero. So X is a random variable because you see what it's doing. It's simply assigning numbers to the outcomes of this experiment. And now obviously this is a very, very simple case. They can get very, very complicated very quickly, but we're gonna stick with this basic case because it'll still illustrate all the principles that we need to know. All right, so um, now the next thing we might wanna know is how about the probabilities? So, in the past, we've calculated probabilities for the individual outcomes. So for example, um, you might recall, since each die has an equal chance 
of turning up odd or even, we can use the multiplication rule to determine the probability. Oh, and also I almost forgot to mention, um, each roll of the die, God, the most important part, independent of the other rolls, we can determine any probabilities we need as follows. So in other words, EE means you get both even followed by even. In fact, you could actually write this as E and E if you wanted to. And since these are independent of each other, it must be true because we know that the roles are independent of each other. And we know that, um, right, in probability just E by itself is a half and the probability of O by itself is a half. So therefore it must be true that this probability is a quarter. Okay, and based on the same logic, we could say that, um, how about the probability of E followed by an O? Same thing. Um, Actually, you know what I'm going to do just to keep them all together in one place. And it'll be the same for all of them. So because the roles each have a probability of one half, evens and odds, I mean, and because the roles are independent of each other, based on the multiplication rule, it must be true that each of these has a probability. Oops. Of a quarter. Now, we already figured that out earlier. I mean, we, we went through this and we showed that when you have all equally likely outcomes, the probability of any one of them just depends on how many elements are in there compared to the entire sample space. But here we have more, a more formal justification for what we're doing here. We're doing this in terms of the um, simplified addition uh, multiplication rule rather. Now, why do we need this information? Because what if I want to know this? Suppose the game that I'm playing will give me a dollar if I get at least one even number when I roll the dice. Okay. I want to know the likelihood of that happening. So remember, X represents the number of even values. So what's the probability? of getting no evens at all. Let's start with that. What's the probability that I don't get any evens? Well, based on what we just did, the probability of getting a double O or OO is the same as X being zero. Remember X is the number of evens. That's a quarter. It's right there. Easy. Now, how about one? Well, the probability of one is the same thing as saying the probability of EO or OE, but remember EO and OE are mutually exclusive.
which implies that this probability can be done with the simplified addition rule. And therefore, what we have is a quarter plus a quarter, which is a half. And how about two? Well, two just means the same thing as saying EE, which we already know is a quarter. We don't have to do any calculations. So you see what we're doing here? We're switching our attention from the probabilities of these individual outcomes to the values of X. Now, all we care about is X. Like for example, with X equals one, we don't care if the dice turned up EO or OE, because either way we have the same outcome. We have an even number, which pays us a dollar. It doesn't matter what order they came in. So now I no longer am interested in EOs and OEs. I'm only interested in the value of X. So there's a 50% chance of getting this number. So we can tie these all together into a nice little table. Let me do that right now, x, p of x. And this table, which only had, does one thing, and that shows all the x's and their probabilities. This is known as a probability distribution. Oh, we're going to see a lot of these. Now, this is a simple case. It's a table with X's and probabilities. Most of the time, I'll mention this here, um, because this is such a simple case, we can express it as a table, but most probability distributions, as we'll see later on, take the form of an equation. Okay, so most of the time we'll create an equation to take the place of a table because otherwise it can get very awkward very quickly. Like what if we roll the die 20 times? Um, then our table would be quite, quite large. And so we typically try to turn this into an equation of some kind. By the way, I just want to mention one other thing. I mentioned this before. I said, what if the game pays us a dollar if we get at least one even number? Now watch how easy this is. Suppose that a game pays a dollar if the roll of the dice turns up at least one even number. What is the probability? of winning a dollar. Well, this is the equivalent of saying it's just x okay. equals or x equals two. In fact, I'll tell you what, let me um, write it like this instead. Just, just to remind you how, what we're actually doing here. Um, this is actually the union. Of these two. But X, these two probabilities, uh, these two events are mutually exclusive, aren't they? Because they, they can't both be true, can they? No. So therefore we can apply the simplified addition rule here. And guess what? We just add them up and I can determine very easily that the chances of winning that dollar is three quarters. Uh, see how easy that is? In fact, I can calculate any probability I want. I can calculate the probability of winning no money or you know, anything I can imagine by using our rules of probability, specifically the addition rule and the multiplication rule. Anyway, a couple of things to note here about this table. These are, um, 
conditions that must be true for a probability distribution. Number one, if you look at it carefully, the probabilities themselves follow the axioms of probability in the sense that each one is, remember from before, is between zero and one. That was uh, one of our axioms. If you look carefully, you see, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> These probabilities all are properly behaved in the sense that there, none of them are below zero or above one. And on top of that, they all add up to one as we require from the axioms of probability. Oh yes, our old friend, the axioms, which tell us that all of these must be true. Otherwise, well, we don't have, I mean, <laughs> we have a mess on our hands. In order for probability theory to make sense, the axioms must hold at all times. It's like the law of gravity it has to hold at all times. Um, it doesn't just take a day off once in a while. Um, gravity always is gravity. So here we have the axioms. And so what that means is that if you have a table like this, where either of those conditions are violated, then it is no longer a valid probability distribution. So you always wanna make sure that your probability distribution has those two properties before you try to do any actual calculations with it. All right, so we're about to introduce some more interesting things. Um, so I think uh, given the time, I think we'll stop for our usual morning break and around 11.30 or so, we'll dive back into this and take it um, into a deeper level. And uh, so, all right, I'll see you all in a few minutes. So um, get some refreshment because what's coming up is pretty complicated. Well, it's not that bad, but it's, it's building on what we're doing here. So you wanna be alert for what's coming next, okay? All right, so see you all in a while.
All right, we're ready. So, um, yes, anyway, so we discussed random variables. The random variable was the X in this case, which uh, is defined here as the number of evens that turn up when we roll the dice. Okay, now, each random variable has associated with it a probability distribution. Now, if you notice here, this is a very simple case. There's actually only three values that X can assume. Okay, it's either got to be zero, one, or two. So, <clears throat> as you can probably guess, there are going to be a lot more complicated probability distributions that we may encounter. For example, if we roll the dice 10 times or 20 times, whatever the case may be, what these all have in common, though, is that the number of possibilities is finite. We can't literally roll the dice an infinite number of times. So when we roll the dice uh, and we keep track of the number of heads or even, sorry, the evens that turn up, this type of random variable is referred to as a discrete random variable because it can only assume a finite number of different values. Now, now you can certainly roll the die the dice a large number of times, but not infinite. So as long as the number of possibilities is finite, then X is said to be discrete. So you're probably wondering, well, what else is there? Well, it's actually possible for the number of outcomes to be infinite. And if that happens, then the random variable, instead of being called discrete, is said to be continuous. Okay, so the word continuous in this context means infinite number of possibilities. So you're probably wondering, how is this even possible? Well, let me give you a quick example of this. <clears throat> and by the way, um, we're not going to consider continuous random variables until chapter seven. Right now, this chapter is exclusively focused on discrete random variables, but we will come into these in chapter six, uh, seven, rather. So here's an example of a continuous random variable. Suppose that our experiment, a very silly experiment, I suppose, but um, our random experiment consists of waiting until the next phone call arrives. Okay, so in other words, for whatever reason, we're waiting for a phone call. It's an important phone call. We're sitting there waiting for it. Suppose we define X as the time until the phone call arrives. Now, X is not restricted to being an integer. Unlike the case with the dice, where we have to have an integer, X is not since time can have a fractional component. For example, X could be 3.172149951 minutes or 1.08. Six, seven, two, five, nine, three, two minutes. And in other words, what I'm getting at here is that the fraction, the time until the next phone call, because we have that fractional component, there's literally an infinite number of times, potential times until that next phone call. The number of possibilities is literally infinite. And so therefore, X is continuous because there are infinitely many times a possible times, I should say, until the next call. All right, so does that make sense to everyone? Um, this one is very, very different <clears throat> because of the possibility because time can have a fractional component, it doesn't have to be exactly two minutes, for example. It can have a fraction. And once that happens, all of a sudden that opens up the possibility to an infinite number of possible times until the next phone call. And so X would be defined as continuous. 
Now, obviously, the continuous random variables will be more complicated to deal with, but we'll, we'll worry about that in the next chapter. Right now, we want to focus our attention on discrete random variables. So now it turns out that in um, many applications, well, actually, before we even get to that, what I would like to do is show you an important way of defining the properties of a random variable. Now you remember that when we were looking at all the way back in chapter three last week, we studied many different measures or summary measures to describe the properties of a sample or a population. Remember we had measures of central tendency, measures of dispersion and measures of association. Well, it turns out that a random variable X can also have several summary measures uh, defined on it that will help us understand the properties of that random variable. They're a little bit different, but they have a lot of the same features as these measures that you're seeing here. So one thing we have to watch out for is that in statistics, we often have multiple names that refer to the same idea. You know, it's, it's something that is kind of a, a nuisance that we can have different names that refer to the same thing. So we just have to watch out for them. This is no exception. The summary measures that we're about to define for a random variable, instead of being called summary measures, they're called moments. Okay, just remember the word moment in this context means a summary measure. Okay, yeah, it had you know, just, you know what happens because the field has evolved over hundreds and hundreds of years and many, many different people contributed to it. So it's not surprising that we have this problem with the terminology that, you know, there's multiple ways of, of uh, multiple names for the same concept. So you just remember a moment is simply a summary measure that's specifically intended for describing a random variable as opposed to a sample or a population. Now, we are only going to look at a few of them. There's more, but these are the most important ones. And you'll recognize right away that two of them look very familiar. The third one may not, but it turns out that it actually is. So let's take a look at them. Um, the three moments that we wanna consider are, well, what do you know? There's our old friend variance and standard deviation. Expected value is just another name for mean. So we actually do know all three of these already, or at least we know what they mean. And <laughs> once again, like I said, this will drive you crazy in statistics. Expected value and mean are the same thing. Ugh, man, does it ever end? But luckily, variance and standard deviation have the same name. We don't have any alternative names for these two. So these are the three that we want to uh, introduce right here. And each one will have its own formula, which is similar to what we did in chapter three, but with one critically important difference. That difference is that here, we have to take into account probabilities, which was not the case with samples and populations. Okay, so in other words, here, with a random variable, it has probabilities that we have to consider. That was not true with samples and populations. Now, just like in chapter three, the formulas will look frightening when you first see them, but after you look at them for a minute, you'll say, oh, that isn't so bad, is it? All right, so let's take a look at the expected value first. Now, the expected value is sometimes known as the first moment of the random variable X, and it's the same thing as its mean or um, value. Now, by the way, let me throw this in here in parentheses. The expected value of X is actually a weighted average of X, X's possible values, where the probabilities are the weights. So just so when you see the formula, you'll say, oh, now I understand what you're talking about. It's a weighted average and the probabilities of the different values of X are the weights. All right, here we go. Let's take a look at this scary formula. And uh, before we do that, let me just remind you, the uh, example we'll be working with is this one. 
we have x, which has three possible values. We have zero, one and two. I'm leaving space for something. We'll see what it is in a second. So here's what we're going to do. As far as the notation is concerned, we're going to call this x1, just like the elements of a sample. Um, each one has its own oops, subscript. And over here, we'll have the corresponding probabilities. So this is the notation that we'll be using from now on. Each element, or I should say, sorry, each possible value of x will have a subscript so we can keep track of them. And then over here on the right-hand side, we have the corresponding probabilities. So when you see the formula, you'll see right away what we're doing, okay? So each x, each possible value of x um, is associated with um, a subscript, in this case, one, two, and three. And then we have the corresponding probabilities. All right, so what do we do with these numbers to come up with the expected value? Well, it's a very simple idea. What you're going to do is you're going to multiply the x's by their own probabilities and add them up. All right, so this formula says to do exactly that. Multiply each x i, in other words, each possible value of the random variable by its probability pxi, and then add them up. That's what this formula is telling me. Ex, by the way, stands for expected value of x. And of course, here's our old friend, the summation operator. And the n means that x can assume n different values. And that's all there is to it. For each x, multiply by its own probability. And when you're done, add them up. So it's really not that painful, is it? No. All right, so we're gonna use our example uh, of when we roll the die twice and X represents the number of evens, and we're going to see the expected value, okay? All right, so what I'm gonna do is quickly write down again the chart. And just keep in mind, this is x1, this is the probability of x1, this is x2, and this is the probability of x2, and this is x3, and this is the probability of x3. And once you plug them all in, um, this one is, of course, a, quarter, a zero, rather, sorry, zero, plus a half, plus a, a, a half, which adds up to one. All right, so that's the expected value. Now remember, this is meant to be an average. So essentially what it's saying is that when you roll the die twice, on average, you should expect to get one even number, okay? Now, sometimes you'll get more, sometimes you get less, but on average, if you keep doing this over and over and over again, you should expect to find that you're getting one even out of each roll of two, which makes perfect sense given that even and odd are equally likely to turn up. Okay, well, that wasn't too bad. Now, obviously the variance formula will be more complicated, but it will be comparable to what we've done in chapter three. The key word there being comparable. Now, um, I'm gonna show you the formal definition of it first, and then we're gonna see how it's actually calculated.
All right, so here we go. The variance, how is that calculated? And of course, it's understood that the variance represents the spread between all the possible values of X. It's still a measure of dispersion. Even though we call them moments, it still has the same role as it did with samples and populations. So, all right, so first of all, it is often referred to as the second central moment. Uh, you don't have to know that. I just wanna mention it. it. It measures the dispersion of X, as you can probably guess, and it has a very formal definition. And then we're gonna see a, a practical definition that lets us actually do the calculations. So first things first, um, the people who developed statistics decided that we don't need a separate um, symbol for the variance of a random variable. This is our old friend sigma. Now, here's the tricky part. You'll recall that we used this already. Um, the sigma by itself is the standard deviation of a population or a random variable. Oh my God. Now, some books, by the way, I wanna mention this though, some books use sigma x and sigma squared x for random variables. What I do wanna point out, you should never get them confused with each other because the data that you're given will make it clear whether we're dealing with a population or a random variable. So this shouldn't be an issue. You know, like saying, well, sigma squared, is that the variance for the population or the random variable? It depends on the problem you've been given. So it, it works in both cases. So <clears throat> this is why no new symbol was invented for the variance of a random variable, because it should be clear from the type of data you have, whether you're dealing with a population or a random variable. So I just want to mention that. Now, this is how you're actually calculating it. Ah, here we go. Now, this is what we're used to seeing. So you're going to take each X, subtract the expected value. And remember, when we did this with the population, it looked like this. What's different between this population and the random variable is that with a random variable, you're multiplying each result by the probability up here, you're just dividing by n. It's, it's the same thing as multiplying. In other words, this one is equivalent to doing this. Ah, see, now it should be more clear. The population version you're taking this term, square term, adding them up, and you're basically multiplying each outcome by one over n. Here, instead, you're using a probability. So you can see the similarities between the two of them. Okay, so let's do this. Let's apply this to our recent example. And again, let me just repeat the table up here. Okay, so therefore here we have x1 minus, now remember also we determined earlier that the expected value of x is one. So this is what you're actually doing.
And when you plug them in and do all the math, you'll end up with a result of one half, as you can see there. So you're, for each X, you're subtracting the expected value. Oh, I almost forgot the square here. Squaring the result, and then you're multiplying by the probability. Then you add them up. So it is very similar to what we did with population and samples too. Very good. Now, of course, now here's something you'll be happy to hear. Just like with the samples and populations, the standard deviation is easy because you're just taking the square root of the variance. It's that simple. That part never changes, okay? No matter what situation you find yourself in, the standard deviation is always equal to the square root of the population, uh, uh, sorry, the variance. So in this case, you literally just take the square root of a half and there's your answer. That's all you have to do. All right, now, with all that being said, um, it turns out that while we already now have seen what a probability distribution looks like, that was a very simple case. Uh, there are many others out there that are very useful for different situations. And in fact, some of them actually have their own names because they're so heavily used in practice. So we're gonna take a look at two of them right now. These are discrete probability distributions that are heavily used in applications because they're so useful. And so we're gonna learn what their properties are and how to use them to calculate probabilities. But remember, these can only be used for very specialized circumstances. So we have to learn what those circumstances are and then how to actually implement these uh, distributions. So we'll start out by introducing two of them and the first one is called the binomial distribution. The second one is called, as you can see, the Poisson distribution. And they both are very heavily used. <clears throat> they have their own unique properties. And um, we'll see that they come in very, very handy, but they can only be used in certain conditions. By the way, there's a hint here. Binomial, this prefix bi, reminds us that this has something to do with the number two. All right, but we'll find out what it is in a few minutes. Okay, bi means two. Poisson, that's named after the inventor of this distribution, so you won't be able to tell from the name. You just know that Poisson invented it, that's all. All righty, now, the binomial distribution. Now, what is this all about? Well, in order to use this binomial distribution, the following conditions have to be true. We're carrying out a random experiment, and each time we repeat the experiment, it's called a trial. So when we were rolling that die twice, we were actually doing two trials of our experiment. So there are trials going on, something is being repeated, like we're flipping a coin, we're rolling a die, um, we're doing, it could be almost anything. Now, if the following three conditions are met, then we can use the binomial distribution to calculate uh, the probabilities that we need. Okay, so here we go. Number one, the trials have to be independent of each other. So like when we're flipping a coin, each coin flip is clearly independent of all the rest. That's what independence would indicate. They're not affecting each other. Number two, and this is where the two comes in. Every time we repeat this experiment, there's only two things that can happen. And we're going to name them success and failure. Okay, now clearly the success usually means the thing that you hope will happen. And the failure is the thing you hope does not happen, but it doesn't really matter which one is which. As long as there's only two possibilities, again, like flipping a coin because you only have heads and tails. All right, so that has to be the case. And this is where the name of course comes from, binomial two. 
And then finally, the probability of success on a trial, which in this book is written with the letter pi. Not, don't confuse this. This pi means the probability of success. on a single trial. Just like when you flip a coin, the probability of getting ahead is one half. This number must never change. Okay, so it's like with your coin. If you're flipping the coin, the probability of ahead never changes. Okay, so it appears then that flipping the coin qualifies as what we'll call a binomial experiment. Okay, so in other words, let me sneak this in here. A random experiment that has all three of these properties is known as a binomial experiment. Um, if X is defined on a binomial experiment, we can use the binomial distribution to compute probabilities for X. Okay, so that's the whole motivation here. The formula itself, let's just say that using the formula will be easier than trying to count. Let's say you flip the coin 10 times and you wanted to know the probability of getting four heads. If you do that by counting, um, you're going to have a lot of, it's going to take a while because the number of possible flips would be more than a thousand. Uh, the number of outcomes, I should say. So it obviously is better to be able to use a formula, but we have to be able to use the right formula. And so we have to make sure when we use this probability distribution that it's valid to use it. In other words, we have to satisfy all three of these conditions. But if we do, we can use this formula and that will save us a lot of time. Okay, um, now, if X is defined as the number of successes that occur during N trials of a binomial experiment, it is said to be a binomial random variable. And now, the word parameters here means it is uniquely characterized by the values of n and pi. Okay, in other words, um, there can be many different binomial distributions. each uniquely identified by the number of trials and the probability of success. So there's a probability distribution, even within the, the, the binomial distribution can have many different versions, I guess you could call them. Each one has its own unique value of n and pi, and we're going to see several of them. So um, x, if x is defined as the number of successes that take place during the n trials of this experiment, x itself is said to be binomial. And then we can now use uh, this very special formula to calculate binomial probabilities. Now the formula itself is going to look a lot scarier than it really is when you first see it, because it may, depends on your background, there's some things in this formula that you may not have seen before. Okay, and if so, that's fine. We're going to go over it anyway. Um, but they're kind of fun things. These are fun concepts that you'll find interesting, I think. So, all right, let's take a peek at this formula and then we'll figure out what it means. All right, so here it is. 
So X is a binomial random variable. Now here we have to be a little careful. There's a capital X and there's a lowercase X. The lowercase version is the number of successes that occur. during the experiment. N is the number of trials. And of course, as we've already seen, pi is the probability of success. I think, yeah, I didn't miss anything. No, no, that's right. That's everything. Now, here's the mystery element right here. What is this thing? This is shorthand notation for something that we'll uh, study right now. You may have bumped into this in your travels before, maybe not. Um, if not, well, I think you'll find this to be kind of interesting. Um, this is shorthand notation for what I'm going to show you. And even now, um, when I show you what it means, you might not recognize what these symbols represent. So we'll go over that right now. Okay, so we'll focus our attention now on this mystery term. And so it's formally defined in the following way. Ah, now there's the thing. What do these exclamation points mean? Well, the actual name of this, this is a mathematical operator and it's formally known as N factorial. Ah, well, what does that mean? All right, well, let's find out. It's kind of a fun operator. And the way it works is it's only defined on integers um, from zero, well, positive integers and zero. Let's put it that way. It is not defined for any fractional numbers, it is not defined for any negatives. So we can think of it as defined only on what we call non-negative integers. So the way it works is this. Now, by the way, you do have, whatever calculator you're using, there is somewhere on that calculator a button that will let you do this directly. You don't have to do this manually. You can find somewhere in there, and that includes the Apple iPhone. There is an operator in there for um, factorials. So we start in the following interesting way. First of all, <clears throat> zero and one factorial are both simply equal to one. Then it gets interesting. Two factorial is two times one, or just two. Three factorial is three times two times one, which is six. Four factorial is four times three times two times one, which is 24. And so from there on, you see the pattern that's developing. For example, seven factorial, of course, would therefore be seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And what does that turn out to be? Well, that equals 5,040. And you can confirm that by multiplying it out or finding this operator on your calculator. It's probably listed as x factorial somewhere in there. Now, what is this thing for? What is it telling us? Well, by itself, n factorial uh, represents the number of ways that a group of n objects can be arranged. Okay, now what do we mean by that? Let's say, for example, um, uh, well, first, an arrangement is a sequence of objects. Okay, so let, let me show you an example of that in the next slide so you can see exactly what this means. Let's say that you have on your room, in your room, you've got room, enough room on the wall for three posters. These are the posters you have, and you want to hang these up on your wall from left to right. Okay, so naturally enough, 
you have a poster for the Yankees, one for Salvador Dali, and one for statistics, of course. And here's the room. Here, you've got room for all three of them from left to right. The question is, how many different ways can you hang these posters in your room? OK, that's all the wall space you have. There's room for three of them from left to right. How many different ways can we hang these? All right, well, what I did was I abbreviated each one and wrote them all down. Y for Yankees, obviously, D for Dolly, and S for statistics. So we can start by simply writing them all down. All right, so if you go through the list, you'll see that this covers all the possibilities. And each of these choices is what we call an arrangement because all you're doing is taking all three of them and changing the order. You're not leaving any of them out. You're not adding anything to it. You're just taking the same three posters and changing the order. And all together, there are six. Now here we did it the hard way. We just wrote them all down. The factorial operator makes it simpler for us. Okay, because what we'll see then is that with the factorial operator, we're going to take three factorial, which is six. So there's six ways to hang three posters. Each of these ways is an arrangement. Now you're probably wondering why it's three factorial. Well, here's the logic. Oops. The way to think about it is that when you have the first poster, There are three ways to choose the first poster because all three of them, none of them have been chosen yet. You can say, listen, I've got Y, D, and S. I can pick any of those three to hang for the first poster on the left. Once I've made that decision though, there's only two left for the second poster. And then once I've chosen the second poster, there's only one left for the third poster. So the number of ways to hang the poster is three times two times one, which is six. That's why it works this way. So just remember, for the first poster, there's three ways of hanging it. For the second one, there's two. And for the last one, there's one. And that's why this gives me the number of arrangements. Ah, OK. Now, when you combine these all together, though, they give us a more complicated idea. And that idea is called, as we'll see, a combination. So combinations are a little bit different than arrangements. So this formula that we were introduced to a minute ago represents the number of ways of choosing X objects from N where the order of selection does not matter. This is what really we're seeing in the binomial formula, by the way. The, the factorials are important, but that when we bring them together, what we're really after is these combinations. In other words, with these, you're selecting. So let me mention this up here. We select X objects from a group of N objects. 
each selection is a combination. Okay, so for this we'll, we'll of course need some examples. The key detail is that the order of selection is irrelevant. All right, so here's a very fun example, this will, which will hopefully make this a little more concrete. What if you go to the mall and they have a haagen there? And they announce that, you know what, today only, we'll give you, if you buy ice cream, we'll give you any three toppings for a dollar. And they tell you that they have five toppings to choose from. So you go to the haagen and you buy some ice cream and say, listen, today only, you can pick any three of these five toppings and we'll only charge you a dollar. The question is, how many choices do you have? Now, by the way, we're assuming that you do not double up. You don't pick three gummy bears, for example. You're picking one of, you're picking one each of five. And of course, since they're all gonna be dumped on the top anyway, the order in which you select them doesn't make any difference. So the question is, how many different choices do I really have? And also note here that because the order of selection is irrelevant, each one of these is a, com a combination. So what we're gonna do first, of course, is make a list. Um, all right, let's make a list. Looks like I didn't do that, so I wanna do that now. I chose these on purpose to make sure they all start with a different letter. All right, let's make a list. I think I got them all. Um, wait a minute. Uh, yeah, no, that's good. Um, no, I got them. Okay. No, I think I, I still think I missed something. GMW. No, GMC. GMW, GMO. GCW, GCO. Oh, I know what I missed. Um, GWO. MWO is missing as well. Okay, now we got them all. There's 10. All right, you see what a pain this is? This is why a formula would be very nice. So there's 10 combinations that we can create by choosing three toppings out of the five. Well, you saw what a nuisance it was to do that directly. Imagine if we had the choice of three out of 10 or something like that. It could have taken all day to figure this out. So that's why we like this formula. So the way this would work is um, let's see. Let me write this down. Um, and yes, and we also discussed here that the order doesn't matter because you know, what if I like for example, if you notice the GMC. I don't need to separately list MCG because they're the same combination. Okay. So anyway, let's let's throw this into the formula. So the formula for combinations is
This is the shorthand notation, but you saw that it's written as this. And in this case, n is five. And we're allowed to pick three. So therefore, we have five factorial over three factorial times five minus three factorial. And if you remember from the way we define these, five factorial is um, 120, three factorial is six, and two factorial is just two. So when I plug these in, I get 10, what do you know? It is 10. So rather than trying to write out a list and possibly messing it up, we're going to just use the formula. Okay. So that's what a combination, that's what combinations are all about. We're choosing objects from a collection in such a way the order doesn't matter. And this formula tells us how many ways of doing this. Now, in the binomial formula, the reason why it's there is because we have to take into account the numbers of different ways that events can take place. For example, if I flip the coin three times, and I want to know the probability of getting one head or 10, if I flip it 10 times and I want to know the probability of getting three heads, um, the three heads could be scattered among the 10 flips in many different ways. It could be the first three flips. It could be the last three. It could be mixed in between. So this part of the formula is keeping track of how many different ways those three flips could be distributed among the 10 flips. The rest of it is pretty straightforward. Um, by the way, one minus pi here would be the probability of a failure, which if we're only interested in heads, in this case, that would be tails. Okay, so this part is pretty straightforward. Pi to the x power, one minus pi to the n minus x power. This was the tricky part. But now we've seen it just simply represents the number of combinations or ways in which we can distribute x successes among n trials. Okay, so you know that, that, was, that was pretty good, important background. Um, we wanna understand what this formula is actually doing when we uh, approach it. Now, by the way, you're probably wondering what happens if the order of selection does matter? Well, that's a different situation altogether. When the order of selection matters, I'll just throw this in here. I'm not gonna need it in this chapter. I just wanna mention it. When the order of selection matters, each choice is known as a permutation. And the number of permutations has its own formula. Okay, uh, which, and by the way, since the order matters, there will always be more permutations than combinations. Okay, um, so we won't actually need that for our binomial distribution, but um, we'll do an example of this so you can see how it works. But, the key detail here is that, um, in fact, why don't I quickly summarize this? Just a quick summary of, of all three concepts. Arrangements, uh, reorderings of a set of objects. Combinations, choices, taken from a set where the order of selection does not matter. And then permutations are 
choices taken from the set where the order of selection matters. We'll spend more time with this tomorrow. I think um, right about here, we can sort of stop for a bit, um, for a bit, I mean, until tomorrow, um, and then we'll pick it up then. Now, we haven't really started to use the binomial distribution. We've just been introduced, looking at the parts of it. So we wanna really use the binomial distribution and understand how it works. And then we'll introduce the uh, Poisson distribution and see how it works and what is it used for. Even more importantly, we want to. Know, it's important to develop a skill for knowing when to use each of these distributions. When is it appropriate to use them? Not just implementing them, but understanding how and when they should be used. So anyway, I guess we've had enough for one day. It's the Monday after Christmas. We got a lot done here. So we'll save the rest for tomorrow and then um, We'll carry on from there. Probably we'll dive into chapter seven sometime tomorrow where um, we're looking at continuous distributions and we'll just take it from there. So we're kind of zooming along here. We're making excellent progress considering how little time we have. And, uh, but don't forget, have the um, chapter three problem set ready for tomorrow. Uh, actually tomorrow meaning tomorrow midnight. So you really, it's almost Wednesday by that time. And then we'll do the same thing for the remaining chapters. Each chapter will have its own unique problem set. And we'll, I'll have you hand them in to make sure that you're understanding. Now, the problem set that I posted in Moodle may contain a Bayes theorem question. If it does, I almost forgot about that until just now. Um, then, yeah, these last, oh my God, they're both here. These last two questions are Bayes theorem problems. You don't, you don't have to do those. So when you do the chapter five problem set, you just have to do these first two. Okay, so I'll make an announcement about that. Um, these two, it doesn't say that they're Bayes theorem, but they are. Okay, so just be aware of that. All right, anyway, I guess we're done and I'll see you all tomorrow, unless there's any last minute questions. I have one. Okay, go ahead. It's actually from like, a couple of chapters ago, but I was wondering how I could find covariance in Excel. Oh, oh, it's so easy. You can't believe it. Let me show you real fast how that works. You just have to make sure you know whether it's a sample or a population, but watch this. Let me just quickly make up two variables. X and Y. Okay, one, two, zero, negative one, four, three, one, zero. Okay. Oh, two people are raising their hand. Um, you can go ahead while I'm doing this. Oh, uh, hi. Yeah, sorry. I just, I didn't see um, the chapter five problem set posted on. Oh, it's on, not there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, think it's I there. thought it was. Oh, even better. Well, you know what? That, I'm glad that that happened because then all I have to do is delete it before I post it and nobody will be confused. <laughs> I, I, I thought that I Perfect. had, that's why I mentioned that. So I'll just delete it and then you won't have to worry about it anyway. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I thought oh. I had already posted it, but I, I, I guess I didn't. And maybe it's just as well. So I'll just take it out of there and then we don't have to worry about it. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, yeah, so the covariance, this is a sample. So we're gonna call it covariance.s and then just tell it where you will find the data for column of for x and for y. And ta-da, it's two. And then the- Oh, that's so easy. Oh, I know. This is, Excel is, is incredible. Um, look at, look at this. Correlation, you don't have to worry about sample or population with correlation. It's the same for both. There it is, ta-da. Okay, thank you. That's it, that's all there is to it. Okay, anyone else? Well, this one's more related to the tests rather than the homework, so. Okay. Uh, how much time do we usually get per test? Um, usually, given the tight time frame we have, I still, I think you'll still have at least a week to get it done. Oh, okay. Now you're not gonna need a week. I mean, the, the tests that I'm giving you are the, meant to be done in the classroom you know, like in an hour and a half. So, um, but if you need the time, you can have it. So you'll definitely have plenty of time to get them done. I think um, in spite of the fact that we only have a month, I'm, you'll, you'll have quite a bit of time. So you have nothing to worry about. Okay, that's good. Okay, anyone else? 
Hi, uh, yes, I just had a couple of questions as okay. well. Um, so just in terms of sort of like when you're looking at a quartile, after you find the second quartile, um, like let's say that it's using like an odd um, sample set, yeah. uh, would you then include that sort of like center or middle number in the first and third quartile? Oh, all right, let's go back. Calculations. It, it should be clear. Um, by the way, you know what I forgot to mention? If people are really interested in using Excel, I'm all for it. But um, here's one of the quirky things about quartiles. It's one of those rare measures where there's more than one way of doing it. And so what that means is if you use this approach, you may not get the same results that you get in Excel. I, I just want you to be aware of that because it might you might say, oh my God, I've done something wrong. No, um, because it may be using a different approach than we are. There's at least three equivalent ways of doing quartiles, and they're not all, they don't always give you the same results. So, but anyway, here, um, for the quartiles. Let's start with odd. Um, you do not include the middle. And the reason for that is because you want the two subsets, you can call them, to have the same size. All right, if you leave this in, where would you put it, first or second? Well, that's the problem. So instead, you just leave it out. So you've got three elements in each subset. And then when it's even, though, you can include it because that still leaves you with the same number of elements in each subset. Okay, so with evens, you do include everything. With odds, you leave out the median or second quartile. Okay, that makes sense. And, and, it's, just, and again, it's because you want to make sure you have the same number of elements in each subset. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then just for like presenting our answers, um, do, would you like us to convert them to decimals, uh, like from roots? No, no, it doesn't really matter. If you leave your, if you write your answers as square root of five, that's fine. Okay, okay. Um, and, and so just to clarify, so for midterm and final, um, we do not have a time limit on those assessments. We're, we're, are we going to be giving them for like a week and then we have to complete it? Yeah, you're basically just going to download it and do it at home and then send the, uh, uh, take pictures of your work and send it back here. Okay, okay. Yeah. It won't be the case that you're getting online and it's like, okay, you got an hour, hurry, get it done now, you know, that kind of thing. I'm sure you've had to do that before. No, yeah. no, no. I think that's, it's, there's no point in rushing you. Um, you should have plenty of time to go through it and think about what you're doing, look at your notes, maybe watch the videos again, look at your book um, so that you have everything in front of you. So you shouldn't have any real trouble with it um, as long as you understood what you were doing. I don't want people to lose points because they're being rushed. Um, you know, like you might get in some classes, but no, it's not a class like this. It's, it's important that you have time to think about what you're doing. Okay, and then for the problem sets, um, would you like us to sort of like show our work and also like the- formula? Yes, now here's the thing. If you show at least some of the steps and you make a mistake somewhere along the way, it's much easier for me to give you partial credits than if you just mm -hmm. write the wrong answer, then I yeah. can't do anything with it. But if, you, if I see what happened, like you went through and get everything right, you forgot that one little square or you, you added two numbers wrong, then I could say, oh, psst, and just take away a very minimal number of points. So it's really for your own benefit. and. Also, I find that if you do force yourself to write out the steps, it, it's harder to make mistakes. Yeah. All right, anyone else? I just had a, a quick question about one of the homework questions, but I sure. emailed you. So I was wondering if you might have any office hours today, um, um, if possible. Probably not today, maybe tomorrow, right after the class is over, we can do something. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, okay. Just remind me during the class, um, but today I have a bunch of stuff I have to do, um, but tomorrow I should be okay. Okay, all right, so I'll, I'll email tomorrow. Thank okay, you good. Awesome. all right, you're welcome. Bye. All right, anyone else? All right, I guess I'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs> all right, bye. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Oh, professor? Welcome. Oh yes, there's one more. I thought, I thought we can get a second with you after class. Sure. First, everybody, nobody wants to stop. It's statistics and they love it too much. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to ask, I haven't had a chance to finish the first problem set. Okay, well, it's not due to tomorrow night anyway. Oh, really? 
Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I thought it was due today. Um, well, okay. it was originally, but I realized it was Christmas break. So, I mean. Oh, th thank you very much. I appreciate okay. that. Right. And uh, I was also hoping I can meet with you at the office hours because I just wanted to clear up some stuff about um, some of the work I've been. Sure. Doing about. Um, yeah. Tomorrow after class, we can hang out here. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Um, I know the classes are being recorded. Is there any way I can go back and view them? Is that possible? Sure. Um, here's what you do. Go to YouTube. Go to YouTube? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's not enough. The thing about Moodle is that apparently it's not set up to hold large files properly. Yeah, a lot of systems like this aren't like, you know, you have yeah. things like Google, they're barely hold. I could barely put a movie on Google. Right, right. Exactly. So anyway, yeah. now if it's got an A there. Now, if you go to just YouTube and type my name, what will happen is when you come up to this red A, that's me. And when you get there, look for the um, playlists. If you look over here under the individual videos, you might still find it. But um, I would the playlists are set up so it's easier for you to find what you're looking for, and they should all be there. So math uh, one, six, uh, 1600 uh, winter. Yes, winter 2022. So um, there's more than one playlist, of course, but there's not that many here. And if you go right to that one, um, everything is, is all organized for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. So I'll meet with you tomorrow. I'll email you before class to remind Yes, and, yeah. we'll do that. All right. Thank you very much, uh, right. uh, Professor. Okay. I'll see you later. You too. All right. Bye.